professor at Harvard. I'm, uh, I've been involved in eustachian tube research for a couple of decades now, and we've uh, done eustachian tube procedures since 2001. So uh, this is the latest iteration. It's the one that's been working the best. I uh, and others uh, worked on the design of the first balloon uh, device to be approved by the FDA. And so I want to present to you uh, some of the experience that we've had uh, in this field based on all of that. Uh, I don't have any royalties from this product, and, you're, and you've been uh, given my uh, disclosures. I have no interest, equity interest in the company. So I'd, I'd like to discuss how it uh, does not appear that the uh, proposed LCD reflects consideration of the latest evidence, the important evidence and a clinical consensus statement from our academy that uh, have recently become available. So the LCD raised four issues, and uh, one, epidemiology was not adequately characterized. Two, the criteria for the diagnosis were not standardized with lack of guidelines. Three was limited evidence of efficacy, and four was absence of long-term data. So what I'd like to show you is that all of these have been addressed by recent high-quality studies and a clinical consensus statement from our American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, which was a, a year and a half long endeavor by a, a lot of people. So going back to the beginning of the uh, of the balloon dilation. So we started doing operations on these station tubes, making improvements with other technology, 2001. Fast forward to 2009, we started using the balloon. It was working better than anything we had come, uh, come up with before, although the results in the past were positive. But this was surprisingly much more uh, robust. And uh, it began to uh, become quite widespread in its use because of that. So just two years later, the, uh, in UK, the National Institute for Clinical, Excel uh, Clinical Health Excellence, NICE, who is uh, world known for their extensive systematic reviews, meta-analyses, their uh, pol uh, position statements based on thorough reviews. So they issued the uh, statement that they uh, did not feel it was ready for general use, but that they would pay for it. It would was, it was be approved for uh, research purposes, so patients enrolled in studies. So that was 2011. The things that they identified as needs not met have been subsequently addressed. Uh, one of the problems was defining the eustachian tube dysfunction, and, uh, and that has uh, been done by now a couple of uh, expert panels and consensus statements. In addition, uh, how do you diagnose eustachian tube dysfunction? So that has been spelled out in an exhaustive uh, review and a study that was done by Smith et al. in Cambridge, UK. I was uh, privileged to be part of this expert panel as well. And with a latent class analysis, they looked at all of the different tests for eustachian tube dysfunction and came up with a, a diagnostic algorithm that we're uh, now using. So based on a lot of retrospective case review studies, some case control studies, uh, systematic reviews, all of that went into the Amer American Academy's clinical consensus statement that was published very recently, and they established a, diagno uh, a uh, criteria for uh, the definition of eustachian tube dysfunction, for uh, patient criteria, indications for the surgery, perioperative considerations including safety, and how to measure outcomes. As a result of all of this and the randomized controlled trials that have come out, NICE has reversed their position in a you know, uh, recently proposed position statement where they do feel that the burden of evidence is now uh, great enough, robust enough to accept the procedure. Uh, the NICE guidelines were based on an exhaustive review. Uh, there are two multicenter randomized controlled trials that have been out. Uh, to date, and now both of those have some longer-term follow-up, total of 383 patients. They also looked at 28 uh, more important studies, including systematic reviews, over 2,000 patients involved, objective criteria were included, and another 41 uh, studies to further support that. So a lot of data went into that. You've already heard about some of the anatomy and physiology. I just want to point out that uh, recent studies have shown that the prevalence 
of this condition is much greater than we had previously thought. Uh, out of Hopkins, 4.5% of the general population, adults, are significantly affected with eustachian tube dysfunction. And the incidence goes up above age 65, 8.2% of uh, uh, above, uh, 65 and above have significant eustachian tube dysfunction. This is a very big problem. And there's other papers showing the burden uh, uh, on our medical system of, the, of caring for these patients. So uh, you've already seen some of these examples of how we can identify the pathology in the lumen of the eustachian tube, and it, it comes from severe to less severe. In these cases, it's just a barrow challenge problem. These patients have difficulty flying, scuba, altitude changes, but it can be quite disabling and actually affect their, their careers. So we can identify those things now, and these are the causes for progressive chronic ear diseases that, as Dr. McElveen was pointing out, these people often need surgery to repair their damaged ears over and over again. They keep getting repeated tympanostomy tubes, and the e eardrums eventually break down. So these chronic patients never stop being chronic. That's why we're looking for an underlying treatment. So based on the clinical consensus statement, and this is based on the work of a uh, Cambridge study, uh, we now have some defined things, items to look for in history, things to look for in the otoscopy, uh, evidence of retraction, we know how to look at nasal endoscopy, and uh, that's been defined. Audiometry, tympanometry, other objective findings, and patient-reported outcomes measures. There's a standard eustachian tube dysfunction questionnaire, seven questions, that um, these uh, are now widely accepted. Multiple studies have looked at the, the validity and, and repeatedly been validated. It's now in multiple languages, so this is pretty universal. Uh, tympanograms are certainly objective. We have normal here, and you can see clearly abnormals, negative pressure there. Here's the eustachian tube dysfunction questionnaire. It's seven questions, quite easy to administer. Uh, we also teach patients how to do Valsalva maneuvers, another outcomes measure that you can use. Now the problem is, as Dr. McElveen said, there is no medical treatment. There's no FDA-approved medical treatment for this condition. And a randomized controlled trial here out of Mayo Clinic showed no benefit, even with the most common thing that's used, uh, nasal steroid sprays. They don't actually work. They make us feel better in prescribing it. There's a lot of unnecessary medical treatment going on here that's not working. Tympanostomy tubes have their limitations, as, as you've already heard. They lead to infections. They eventually can break down tympanic membranes if it's repeatedly placed. And these patients become chronic ear disease who need reconstructive surgery frequently, repeatedly. So here's just to review the randomized controlled trials. Now keep in mind these studies were done uh, under very rigorous FDA demands. So randomized controlled trial, we're not allowed to do adjunctive procedures even though it would be appropriate. And for this first study, we had to show to the FDA that we could normalize the results. And that's a much higher burden of proof than what you normally have to show for um, you know, just significant improvement. So, in, in the absence of adjunctive procedures and normalization, these are the results. So uh, in, the, in the balloon group, 51.8% normalized their tympanograms versus the control steroid nasal spray only, 13.9%. Most of them crossed over, so we'll follow the treatment group for durability. And at 24 weeks, it was holding up and even a little better at 62%. The eustachian tube dysfunction questionnaires, the PROMs, 56.2% uh, normalized in the treatment group versus 8.5. And as Dr. McElveen pointed out, these were so compellingly, significantly significant, uh, statistically significant, that the FDA stopped the study early. Very unusual for a de novo uh, application to the FDA. So when we look at the one-year follow-up that's been recently published, we're seeing that those results are durable. After one year, uh, the normalization of tympanograms and uh, reported outcomes are, are still holding up. And we think this is because it's similar to doing an adenoidectomy. We're ablating the adenoid-like lymphoid hyperplasia in the lumen of the eustachian tube, where we couldn't previously get to it. A similar study from the uh, other balloon device, and here 57.1 versus 10 
for tympanograms and minus 2.9 improvement in mean scores versus 0 0.6. Uh, so minus two, uh, so uh, 2.1 is the cutoff for a normal. So uh, this was, again, very strongly significant uh, in, in the results. So when you look at the eustachian tube uh, scores here, the blue is their pre-op scores, high. The orange is the one-year follow-up. The gray is the last follow-up, which had a mean of 29 months. And you can see those <coughs> improvements in those scores have been extremely durable. Other longer-term follow-up studies. So these are retrospective. Uh, Silvola, this is from Finland, where I was participating in that. Mean of 2.5 years to pentagrams normalized, 79%. Ability to do a modified Valsalva, 80%. Preoperatively, none of them could do it. This is the biggest study so far uh, in Germany. Schroeder, uh, some uh, 1,000 eustachian tubes, and out to three years, still holding up at 82%. Uh, Hoisman had the best systematic review to date. The largest number, 1,100 plus patients, seven month mean follow-up, but some of those were quite long-term, and they showed significant improvement in all of the outcomes measures that have been uh, adopted by the clinical consensus statement. Uh, this is our study here, ASHRI, a different cohort than I showed you earlier, mean of 1.3 uh, years and success rate 79 percent, and again, those outcomes. Fin another Finnish study, Lukainen, uh, mean follow-up, 3.1 years, 75 percent improved uh, in their uh, PROMs. So the, um, we've, we've proposed some language that's taken right out of the clinical consensus statement for um, when balloon dilation of the eustachian tube is scientifically indicated. So uh, for the following two possible groups, the, the symptoms have been present chronically over three months. The, di the nasal endoscopy shows evidence of pathology. We can see that. There's objective evidence with the tympanograms neg showing negative pressure. You can see this on the otoscopy with negative pressure. And you've got the PROM, uh, the Eustachian tube questionnaire that uh, co uh, correlates with that. Or they may only have altitude change pressure problems, but it's a consistent history and they still have objective evidence of pathology. So that's what we're looking to treat. And in that case, of course, their tympanograms and audiograms may be normal, so that's why that's a separate group. There are a number of exclusion criteria that we've listed, again, from the clinical consensus statement. So as a result of this robust evidence that's now available, our American Academy last week uh, presented an application to the AMA panel for a request of a Category 1 CPT code. Um, LCDs have now been published to accept this procedure at the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Nebraska, North Dakota, Highmark, and uh, now in Massachusetts, uh, uh, Blue Cross coverage is now in effect for Medicare, and they're planning to consider uh, general commercial as well in February next year. Um, just to make a point in the LCD as, as printed on page four of nine, there was a uh, summary of evidence in the second paragraph where it uh, talked about limited evidence for comparative benefits. So there are two studies now, level three. These are uh, matched cohorts of comparison between a balloon in patients who've had previous tubes, balloon versus how many in the, in the uh, matched cohort needed further tubes. Both studies showed marked significance in their Kaplan-Meier curves out to two years in one study, five years in the other study. Uh, so a, a big difference in the patients who only got the tubes needing repeated tubes, whereas that was stopped to a much larger degree in the balloon group. So that, that will be coming out into publication. Uh, on page six of nine, the top paragraph talks, uh, it's quoting me, um, the choice of management strategies for isolated eustachian tube dysfunction remain controversial. So this was actually taken out of context. We're talking about the medical management of uh, eustachian tube dysfunction, which is generic and hasn't been shown to work. So yes, that is, that is uh, uh, of course, controversial. And uh, so that was not specifically talking about balloon dilation, where the evidence is robust. So thank you for this opportunity to speak. Appreciate that very much. Thank you.
So the question is, uh, what goes into a clinical consensus statement? So th this is a process uh, that uh, our, our academy and, and others, uh, other similar uh, uh, d disinterested objective uh, bodies uh, will hold in which a, a, an expert panel is convened to do a systematic review of all the available evidence. And then we, uh, you look to see uh, there's, there's a process called the Delphi method in which the uh, evidence is brought forward and the participants submit uh, their, their thoughts about what items can we agree upon, what's important, uh, and of those things, what are the issues that are important, and of those issues, what can we agree upon that there's sufficient evidence. And so you go through this process, people vote on these things. If there's insufficient, you have to reach a certain statistical level for something to be adopted as, as a uh, consensus, with consensus. And then there's a number of things that don't reach consensus. Uh, and there's a number of things which uh, are borderline. And all of that's discussed in such a paper. So it's a lot of back and forth, enormous number of hours of work. Uh, like I said, it's an hour, it was a uh, year and a half long process. So it, short, it falls short of a clinical practice guideline that requires even more systematic reviews, uh, in, in which case uh, there's an even longer uh, benefit. So clinical consensus statements are issued when a procedure is in widespread use, uh, when there's lots of evidence for it, and, uh, but we just don't have enough systematic reviews to do a clinical guideline. Thank you.